My wife and I have differing opinions on what my daughter's first words were. My wife thinks it was some sort of version of Ben or Bean, her brother's name. I'm pretty sure it was that's not fair. Just saying. It's what she said the most in her life, and she's not the only child who has this phrase down. That's not fair. Sometimes it's said with stomping feet. Sometimes it's said on the ground while being drugged by one arm as they do the whole limp noodle thing. That's not fair. The more, the more they see in the world, the more clearly they can see what is fair and what is not. But it, in our childhood, we seem to have such a clearer understanding, a clearer lens for what is and what is not fair. They got more than me. They already had a turn. They didn't earn a sucker. That's not fair. Children have a strong sense of what is and is not fair. But over time, as we get older, we start to see the gray area in things, right? We start to recognize there's not just fair and unfair, right and wrong. We see the gray area, especially because we want to live in the gray area sometimes instead of having to be fair. Sometimes this in-between, this fair, not fair, this gray area, sometimes comes up in areas of justice. We recognize the world just isn't fair. Some have more than others. Some don't have nearly enough. It's not fair. Sometimes there are theological issues that come up. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. It's not fair. Still, other times it seems like it's more of a personal issue. We expect things. We've earned things. We work for things. And it's not fair when we don't get them. It's not fair. How often have you heard an adult complaining and thought they sounded like their childhood toddler self being channeled through at whatever age they are? It's not fair. We didn't get what we deserved. In reality, fairness often starts as a justice or a theological issue. That's where the conversation begins. But too often, it comes back to a personal issue. As some of the young adults I've done camp with always say, it's a you problem. It may start out as an issue with them, with the community, even a concern or a lament or a complaint to God. But in the end, as we complain, the more we complain, the more it becomes about us. In our parable today, the landowner goes out to hire some extra hands for the vineyard. You would think, you would think they would have hired enough the first time, right? I'm just guessing this isn't the first time the landowner has hired people to work in the vineyard. You would think that managing the fields is something fairly predictable. They know how many hands they need to get the work done. They do it every year. Yet somehow, looking outside and seeing more people, the landowner thinks, I'll hire some more of them. So off they go to work in the vineyard. Multiple more times in the day, the landowner sees people in the marketplace not working, which begs the question, why does the landowner keep going back to the marketplace, right? Did they keep forgetting something every time they went? Or is the landowner so wealthy that they're just hanging out downtown all day while the poor manager runs back and forth to deal with all these people that the landowner keeps hiring off the street? At the end of the day, there are more people who still don't have work, who still don't have work. And it seems the landowner has suddenly discovered an unemployment problem in the community and says, fine, all of you go off to work. Everyone, everyone should have the dignity of work. We can already see in the story issues of justice bubbling up, issues of fairness bubbling up. By the end of the story, those who get paid the full day's wage for a full day's work have a complaint, an issue of fairness with those who only worked an hour. It's not fair. You can imagine the giant lips pouting, not fair. 
I worked all day. They didn't do anything. But the landowner, who's recently discovered unemployment, has also discovered paying people a living wage. It seems the landowner has asked the justice questions as well. Maybe the landowner was wondering, why did these people get hired first? Was there some sense of hierarchy? Was there some sense of others pushing to the front? Is there a sense of discrimination within it? Is there some seniority code that we're sticking to here that's kept others from some working and others not? So everyone goes home with enough to care for their family. The justice question starts early, but that doesn't keep the people in the story from being upset. I wonder, I wonder why those early workers get upset. It's the same question that the landowner asks. I wonder why you're so wound up about this. I wonder if you are upset. I wonder if you're upset because you're jealous. It's amazing how often it comes back to being a you problem. What starts out as a justice problem is revealed to be a you problem. Sadly, it comes back to entitlement, to expectations. It comes back to a personal problem of the angry workers. Can you imagine the landowner's multiple responses? You don't like generous people? I thought we were all supposed to be generous. Isn't that the goal? To give, to be loving, caring people? Yet when we are on the downside of fairness, when we're on the opposite side of generosity, when someone gets more than they deserve, we see it as justice or an injustice. Now, we don't know how this story ends. It's always the mark of the great parables. Some of the best ones Jesus told have no ending to them. We don't know how the workers responded after this teaching. We don't know if they stopped complaining and changed their attitudes. We don't know if some of those who got paid equal for less work heard the complaint and said, you know, that you're right, that's not fair, and gave some of theirs back. We don't know if the relationship among the workers changed because of the generosity of the landowner. We don't know how the story ends, but we do know how it plays out in our world today, don't we? We've seen versions of this. It's an analogy we can see very well as we get into issues of fairness around us. When watching sports, and yes, my Kentucky Wildcats are playing right now, and I assume there's a referee hosing them at this moment, and I will shout about fairness if we haven't won today. Umpires, referees, if it doesn't go our way, it's unfair. They didn't do their job or they're on the other team's side. When it comes to our world today, we know how this story gets played out. It's unfair and we're the victims. In the news, we cry foul when someone bad gets something good. When we watch celebrities, we complain about the wrong person getting the award. In politics, we pitch a fit when we see people being unfairly rewarded. Unless, unless it benefits our side, right? And then it's all just fine. When our team wins, we think the bad call was just a makeup for one earlier in the game. Bad calls happen. It didn't affect the outcome of the game any. When someone we identify with is in the news, we call it beating the system. Or we say, it's okay, they've had a hard life and they finally got a break. When the celebrity we like gets an award, we suddenly love the movie that put us to sleep, and we say, it's more of a body of work recognition than this actual award. When it's our political party, we suddenly see all of that gray area come up. We say, well, you know, they're all corrupt, but they're still better than insert name here. We're all for fairness as long as it goes our way. It seems that we're all big fans of fairness for ourselves. We like being treated equally when equally is to our advantage, not so much when it gives someone else a break. We like being given grace when it's to our advantage, not so much when someone else gets our free pass. 
Didn't they know we earned that grace? We earned that love. We earned that opportunity. And this is where the parable and really the whole gospel is at odds with our modern American culture. We have a narrative about working hard, getting us what we have fairly deserved. We have a narrative that assumes that there are a limited amount of resources out there for us to fight over. Think about some of the common sayings we hear, we hear but we don't really stop to think about. Sayings about our, our American work ethic. Earn your keep. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, like any of our jobs have boots these days. Be a self-made man or a self-made woman. God helps those who help themselves. And none of these is scriptural. None of these reflect the gospel. They express the sentiments of our culture, not the teachings of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying we should be lazy, but our idea of fairness, our idea of fairness is completely at odds with grace and unconditional love as expressed in Scripture. They are completely at odds with how the Scripture talks about fairness. God's love is given for people even when they haven't earned it. Thanks be to God. God's grace finds us even when we don't feel worthy. Thanks be to God. God's family is made up of all families, even those that would reject God, even those that would doubt, even those that would turn away. Even when we have made as big a mess of things as we can, God still reaches out and loves us, and that is completely unfair. Thanks be to God that God is about generosity more than fairness. And not just generosity, but extravagant generosity. That's why I find it ironic when we hear leaders in our nation talking about Christian values. American culture is not shaped by Scripture nearly as much as we think. And so often when we start projecting God into our culture, giving God credit for things, we make ourselves feel look silly by our unwillingness and inability to truly follow the teachings of Jesus. So much of our economy, our government, even our entertainment is based on strong competition. Our culture is competitive, putting values on winners. Our culture is competitive, putting worth on people as they elevate themselves. Not as they humble themselves. Our culture is competitive. It wraps everything with this warped, false narrative of fairness. We live in a fair society where anybody can grow up to be anything they want as long as you have the resources. Where anybody can grow up to be anything you want as long as you get the lucky breaks. Where anyone can grow up to be anything as long as, as long as. And that's where we get in trouble. We can come up with a whole list of as long as is, places where one person has privilege more than another, a place where some have opportunities others don't have. We're all for fairness as long as it's helping us. But in our culture and community, we're not so much about creating fairness for everyone because someone 50 years ago worked for our opportunity that we freely received. The gospel challenges our understanding of fairness. It challenges our understanding of competitiveness all the time. But it's hard. It is hard to change our mindsets. It's hard to filter and separate what is the secular from what is the sacred. When I was in seminary working at a church camp in Kentucky, one of the people who had been a counselor for me as a kid was there on staff. I was finally old enough to be with some of these spiritual giants of my childhood, leading other young people. And the first day of camp was always group games. It was like relay races, field games you'd imagine from school, helping each little group get to know each other better and work as a team. And I remember us having seven groups lined up in rows for a relay race. And Ed was the counselor I thought was the funniest as a kid. I looked up to him one day I wanted to be like Ed, and I looked in Ed's groups at the other end of the line from mine, and I thought, I've got a chance for my group to beat Ed's. And then I realized Ed's group is cheating mercilessly. Mercilessly, unapologetic. One of the kids in my group cries out, they're cheating! 
And one of the other counselors shoots out, shouts out, what would Jesus do? And Ed, the spiritual giant, says, Jesus would win. We laughed. Because it was such an honest critique of all of us. It was such an honest statement about how we all play with fairness, but don't really claim it. It was such an honest critique on how we manipulate the teachings of Jesus to our advantage. We're all for fairness when it's to our advantage, but we're not always for justice when it creates an unfairness for us. We have to stop worrying about winning, getting ahead of others, putting ourselves above others. We have to stop worrying about our fair share, counting blessings so that we can compare ours with others, calculating our value based on stuff or personal successes. We have to stop letting our expectations for fairness get in the way of God's freely given grace. We have to stop letting our expectations of fairness get in the way of God's grace. One of the first lessons children learn in school, you get what you get and you don't pitch a fit. Preschool teachers and kindergarten teachers share this mantra now with children every day and often with the parents as well. You get what you get and you don't pitch a fit. You don't lay on the ground and say, that's not fair. You don't put out the lip. You're thankful for what you have. I wonder if a better way to say this for us grown-ups is, you get what you get, others get what they get, and God loves you both the same. You get what you get, others get what they get, and God loves you both the same.